Welcome back, YouTube. Um, today we're going to be doing kind of a summary of our theology. Hold on, this camera. There we go. Um, do a kind of a summary of the Orthodox theology um, as it's found in St. John of Damascus. Let me fix this. All uh, getting all funky up in here. Okay. Um, yeah, the summary of the Orthodox faith as it's found in St. John Damascus. St. John Damascus lived during the 8th century, so uh, 700 AD um, in there. Uh, he was in Damascus, um, which is why he's called St. John of Damascus, which was overran by uh, the Islamic tradition at that time. So there's a couple things I want to get into with that. But before we get really deep into that, I want to give a shout out to Telusbound and Trey. Uh, thanks for coming on, man. I had a great conversation. Everyone seems to really love that. Um, we're going to have another guest on Tuesday, which I will be announcing uh, later this weekend. I'm um, hoping to continue to have guests on and you know, do, do interviews and introduce people to this channel um, and to my subscriber base that uh, are as knowledgeable or more knowledgeable than I am. So it's really cool to be getting involved in the community a little bit um, and starting to get our ideas shared. So had a great time with that. Looking forward to more to come. Um, so let's get into this because why is this important and what do we really need to glean from this? Why orthodoxy? What what makes orthodoxy different? Now, to people who haven't heard of orthodoxy or kind of what it is, um, this is going to be the first foundings, uh, the first founded churches and church fathers of the Christian tradition after the death of Christ. Um, churches established by Paul, the Orthodox see themselves as kind of a continuation of Acts. Um, because it's the Acts and the apostolic tradition, or the tradition handed down by the apostles themselves. Now, what's really important about this um, that really was eye-opening to me is we don't get the first comprised canon or group of scriptures that we would know as the Bible today until the 4th or 5th century. Now, there were... Uh, uh, comprises of certain uh, texts, and some churches had more than others, um, but there was in, in no way up until the real canonization of the Bible, uh, like a really firm uh, and founded Bible itself. That means that the tradition isn't just the Bible, that the tradition is also the oral tradition and the liturgy and the tradition handed down in the churches. Okay, and this is something I, I think the apostles talk about if you read the New Testament. And if you really look into some of the Greek and the context of when the Bible was written. So the Bible doesn't ex just exist in a vacuum on its own uh, as like some book that dropped out of the sky. Uh, this is a revealed tradition and doctrine uh, and theology that comes down to us from God. Not from man, not from man's reasoning, not from sola scriptura or any of that or sola fie, none of that. It, it, is a, it is an encompassed and enriched tradition uh, that was forced to defend itself at that time against much of the Greek and Islamic and Gnostic heresies that were surrounding that culture. Now, what's really important about this is by the time orthodoxy starts really establishing its 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 thought process in addressing these heresies uh, in the in the Cappadocian fathers in the third century, third fourth century, um, there was already a long going Greek philosophical tradition as well, um, and this is something that I've been looking into a lot as, as people who have followed this channel and seen some of my previous videos on Neoplatonism. Uh, Plotinus is in the, in the third, second century. 
Okay, and so he's coming before even the church fathers really start to establish uh, their theology. Now, that's not to say that this theology wasn't already thought out or established. It just wasn't being made known to the masses. It was just known within the churches um, and kind of handed down in tradition. Uh, but the Greeks, they had a different idea on where to start their theology. They were searching for a first principle to reality because they were really enamored with uh, dialectics, okay, which which are oppositional terms uh, such as good and evil, beautiful and ugly, light and dark, okay. Um, and they're trying to reason from these oppositions to a unifying category that can kind of define and encompass <clears throat> the world so that they could think out a fully thought out, rationalized uh, system that systemically answers all of these questions about reality. Um, this is going to lead from Pythagoras and the Pythagoreans to uh Zeno and Parmenides and Plato. And when we get to Plato, we really start to see the first real refining of the dialectical tradition. Plato is going to come in with Socrates, right? Because Socrates is the mouthpiece of Plato in his dialogues. And they're going to start to wrestle with this and, and kind of see this dialectical process as a process of giving birth to uh, ideas to wisdom. Socrates himself uh, referred to himself as um, as like the usherer or or the 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 woman that helps you know give birth. I forget what they're called for whatever reason. He saw himself as like one of those, but with wisdom and knowledge. Right. He he never. Kate comes into these dialogues positing much about his own thought. And in fact, in the dialogues of Plato, it comes up where people start questioning him like, hey, you know, you're always trying to give advice or I mean, you're always trying to help other people find wisdom. But we don't know much about your own ideas, Socrates. And Socrates was like, you know, well, I'm learning along with um, all these people I'm helping. So it's it's this this process type of philosophy that picks what would normally seem as uh, opposing ideas and searches for higher and higher unities between them. Okay, and the example I give all the time because Stephen Coughlin, Dr. Stephen Coughlin, gives this idea um, between two apples, right? A red apple and a green apple. Well, red and green are in opposition, but the essence or form of apple is shared between both those apples, even though they're different colors. It doesn't make them different. They're still categorized the same. Only the particular aspects of them can be different without affecting the form. So Plato's dialectical process will lead, without getting into all the esoteric and, in my opinion, satanic leadings of his philosophy, He's also going to be very useful in helping us kind of categorize our world um, and Aristotle, especially to follow. Okay, Aristotle is going to do the same thing. He's going to take these universal unified forms and he's going to kind of immunitize them into the material world and is really trying to say and give us a, a natural theology from the material world up to what we could posit as a god, or in his case, a prime mover. Okay, and then Plotinus is bouncing between both of these as he comes after Plato and Aristotle and the Middle Platonic era. Um, he is heavily in favor of Plato, but critiques Aristotle and clearly knows Aristotle's uh, theology and philosophy. Now, all of this is to say and to kind of show where the Greek thought was and what their obsessions were, okay? And they, they were clearly obsessed with these principles to reality, truth, objective truth, subjective truth, uh, distinguishing between uh, man's soul and man's rationality, and eventually leading up into Plotinus, uh, positing his own Trinitarian system to this, 
with the good, the intellect, and the soul in a hierarchy, ontological assimilation or ordering. Okay. Now, all that's to say that the Orthodox tradition, the Christian Orthodox tradition, which, mind you, is the first Christian tradition, not only the first Christian tradition, but the first Christian tradition to really take on uh, the issues of the pagan world by not just ignoring them, by not just saying, yeah, no, that those are bad. No, by directly uh, engaging with them and logically disproving them. A lot of the church fathers, including St. Jan Damascus, uh, were heavily uh, educated in the Greek philosophies, in Greek rhetoric and literature. Um, St. John Damascus clearly knows about Aristotle. He uses his classifications for species and genus um, in his book on, on philosophies in here. Um, and he's also looking back at the entire uh, Orthodox tradition and really seeing um, the factors that played the biggest roles. What helped them defend their theology the best against all these different ideas? And why is defending our theology and really thinking out how our religion works? Why is that so important? Well, I think today could be a great argument for that. Um, <clears throat> I don't think many people today, not all, but I don't think many people today know much about the history of Christianity or thoughts and traditions of it. Um, most people are familiar with Christianity as it is after kind of the Protestant Reformation um, and shifts into the Enlightenment. Um, you know, the, the 1500s Martin Luther era up into today's time. That's the normal Christian tradition and what's gleaned from it. Um, and the Orthodox, the Eastern Orthodox tradition is merely uh, swept under the rug um, to most people in the Western tradition. Because we got to understand that the Western tradition, the Latin West and the Greek East, took their shifts from each other and uh, they shifted away from each other partially due to the, the Catholic schism, uh, but also due to language and translational barriers. Okay. We had a Greek eat. We had a Greek speaking and writing tradition that was nearly 2000 years old at the least 1500 years old and with the church fathers themselves, a thousand years old. It's a long time. Um, and all of a sudden the West, you know, starts to cultivate its civilizations from the East, uh, especially after the schism and they're speaking Latin and Latin wasn't getting translated into, or Greek wasn't getting translated into Latin uh, like it should have been. And on top of that, uh, really only the popular works of the Greek East were being translated, such as Aristotle, Plato. And again, this Greek hermetic uh, influence. And if we don't know what hermeticism is, this is a form of Gnostic-esque religion, which coins its name from Hermes Trismegistus, Okay, who is the leading conduit between man and God in uh, the Hermetica, which was a, a, a Greek religious Gnostic text that uh, kind of lays out the inner workings of how man can raise himself to God, uh, which the Greeks wrote about kind of being a... Uh, copy and paste in a lot of ways from the Egyptian tradition, okay? So Thoth in the Egyptian tradition and the Umbral Tablets uh, has an eerie uh, similarity to uh, Hermes Trismegistus in the Hermetica and his relationship between the gods and man. Okay, so, and, and not only that work, uh, there's many other Gnostic works at this time. So the church fathers were really forced to answer the question, why should we believe you, 
over all of this other explosions of religious thought. And they put forward, in my opinion, um, an almost perfect theology. I mean, watertight. Um, they had to defend themselves against all kinds of things. So now that we kind of got this context laid, which is a vast, vast topic um, for deeper looks, I recommend Aristotle East and West by Dr. David Bradshaw. Look that book up. Uh, that tracks kind of the Aristotelian thread line into the East and the West, um, specifically on the term energia and how Aristotle, who coins the term energy, as we know it today, energia, uh, how he uses it in his philosophy and, and ends up evolving into a term that basically uh, we used to, they used to talk about their interactions with the divine. Becomes a pretty important term. Um, and this also kind of tracks this thread and he starts to show you why the West really lacked on its interpretations of this because it was really just ill-informed on a lot of deep metaphysical topics. Um, Another good book is The One of Many by Rush Dooney, also traces this. Um, <clears throat> Christian Theology and Greek Metaphysics, forget who that's by, uh, but you can probably type that into Amazon and just find that. Um, there's many books on this topic. This is an academic scholarly topic. It's, it's pretty straightforward once you start to get into uh, how this stuff works. Um, so this is why the, the church fathers in the East are so important, um, because after the West, and if you think of Christianity as today, that's actually not the belief of the church fathers. They weren't this uh, free-loving, um, open, uh, believe anything type of Christianity we see today. I'm not saying all are, and I'm not saying you are. If you're watching this, I'm just saying in general, um, I think you'd be hard pressed to find a good argument against uh, how Christianity today hasn't diluted itself in one way or another. And it's going to be due to their lack of theological discipline, their lack of defining their terms and defining their religion and thought. Uh, so it cannot be influenced or swayed by external sources. Now, in St. John Damascus' uh, philosophical chapters, if you'd like to get this book, I highly recommend it. I will show it on the screen so you guys are more than welcome to go buy this on Amazon. Um, if you want to know the Christian tradition, uh, this is a great place to start to at least get assimilated with the topics. <clears throat> but St. John Damascus is going to open up and, and, and really talk about the importance of knowledge, and why we have to define it. And this is what he says. He says, nothing is more estimable, esteemable, sorry. Nothing is more esteemable than knowledge. For knowledge is the light of the rational soul. The opposite, which is ignorance, is darkness. Okay? So he's saying right now, he's, he's saying, look, this isn't just a spiritual assumption. This isn't just a good feeling, okay? This, we're defining our, our belief through rationality and also through spirituality in the heart. And this is important. We need to have a rational belief. Okay, and the Greeks and pretty much everyone at this time uh, knew that man was different from animals because of their consciousness and their rationality. And he's saying that's something we shouldn't just let run about. Okay, we shouldn't just let that run amok and 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 fall back into animalistic tendencies. No, we must define ourselves by being educated, by being rational and being logical. And that is important. And I don't know who would really argue with that. He goes on to define exactly what he means by knowledge. He says, by knowledge, I mean the true knowledge of things which are. Because things which have be which have being are the object of knowledge. False knowledge, insofar as it is a knowledge of that which is not, is ignorance rather than knowledge. For falsehood, falsehood is nothing else but that which is not. 
So he's saying, look, we're what I'm saying by knowledge is knowing that which is real versus that which is not real. And how do we draw that line? Well, that's a philosophical problem. Okay. So <clears throat> later he's going to go through the philosophical the philosophical um, <clears throat> kind of dispositions of that time and kind of define some some terms up until that point from the Aristotelian tradition, but also the rest of the Greek philosophical tradition, such as being and accident and essence and potential and how those things uh, differentiate. And, and this is important because these terms are going to later be used in his writings in the Fount of Knowledge uh, for him to really start to lay out um, his theology of the Eastern Church. <clears throat> um, he goes on to make some good transcendental arguments, which if you're not familiar with the transcendental argument, I highly recommend you look up J. Dyer and type in transcendental argument um, and have him explain that because he has many videos, hours and hours, uh, defining that and really thinking that through and why it's important. But in a brief synopsis, the transcendental argument is basically the argument for immaterial realities. Hence, transcendental or uh, transient or uh, transcending materiality. Okay, so it's principles such as logic, math. Okay, so although this cup is just one cup, the number one is a universal category that any material object can slip into. But these categories exist in themselves outside of the objects that they associate with. So it becomes, uh, he starts to make these arguments uh, of, of these transcendental categories, uh, these universal categories to human nature that are logical and are proven. So he goes on to do that. He goes on to define these terms. And now we're going to skip to <clears throat> the exact exposition of the Orthodox faith and book one. This is where St. John Damascus is going to get into the Orthodox faith and where we start our theology. What's so important? Because where do the Greeks start their theology? Where do they start their philosophy? Natural world in man and attempting to solve the dichotomy between natural, the natural world and man with their rationality alone. St. John Damascus does not do that. Why? Because he knows that man is fallible or faulty or prone to error. So by rationalizing the material world and trying to solve all the dichotomies of reality within yourself by definition is set to fail because you don't have that type of perception on reality. You don't have a universal perception on reality. You have a particular perception on reality that you can use analogies to uh, hint at or find confidence in metaphysical categories, but you yourself do not have a metaphysical perception on the world. So we don't start by assuming that the rationality of man uh, is infallible, infallible, or not prone to error or perfect. Okay. And this is going to be a heavy uh, Greek philosophic presupposition. And I'm currently reading through all of Plotinus. He does this exponentially, uh, first thing off the bat. But where does St. John start? He says, no man hath seen God at any time. Why is that important? Because the Greeks, again, are obsessed with this first principle. And they're trying to figure out the essence of God, right? Because their definition of God is that which encompasses all reality that which all things stem from 
and produce into, into particular or multiplicity or variability out of this first principle. What is that first principle? What is in all categories? Well, the Greeks' assumption is that they can know the nature of God. What does the Bible teach? No man has seen God at any time. Okay, and what is God to an Eastern Orthodox tradition? It is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So no man knows the nature of the three hypostases, the divine hypostases, or divine persons. Nobody knows the nature of the three divine persons as they are in themselves. Only God does. Okay, we're just man, dude. We're not even angels. Like, we're not even... We're not even on the ladder yet, and we're going to try to make a claim that we can know about the nature of God. No, we cannot. And this is exactly what we need in today's world as well and in a lot of the uh, New Age, Gnostic, uh, you know, psychedelic trip type religions we see today. Uh, they claim to get some secret knowledge or they claim to have some source or glimpse or secret into the divine nature. Oh, the world's all one, man. No, it's not. That's the monad. And that Plato already said that, dude. Okay, so what does he say after that? He says, the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him. The Godhead then is ineffable and incomprehensible. He says, we can't know that. We can't know the nature of God as they know themselves. We will never tap that mystery. That mystery is infinite and untappable. So to assume that you can just rationalize your way up from the natural world to a first principle using these Greek dialectics in tradition is wrong. And he says it's wrong because we'll never be able to know that. That's way beyond our comprehension. So where does he start our theology? By stating that. Saying, hey, let's, let's, let's state the obvious here. Uh, let's not forget we're people. We're just humans. Uh, how can we ever assume we know exactly how God is in his nature? The Bible is very clear that no man has seen the Father at any time. Okay. No man. Now, for anybody arguing, saying, well, what about the Old Testament and all the times the angels appeared and it says, you know, God showed himself to whatever. That's Christ. The, 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 East, the Eastern Orthodox tradition believes that that is Christ in the Old Testament, that the whole reality functions on this, this, tr this three part pattern that basically goes from the father through the son. In the spirit. From, through, in. If you read Genesis, that's how the world was created in Genesis. From the Father, through the Son, in the Spirit. So the image, the representation, the perfect icon of the Father is Jesus Christ. Because the Father exists so beyond all being and comprehension that him showing himself to almost any being uh, would destroy that being and its reality. It's, it's just so uncomprehensible. Okay, so the Father shows himself through the icon of the Son, okay, who is in the image of the Father but also assumes human nature thus sanctifying our human nature. This is what's so important. Uh, this is why it's so important. If you look full, if you look in the Greek tradition, you really get accustomed to the Greek philosophy. The principle they're really looking for isn't the first principle. The principle they're looking for is the principle that balances the problem between the divine and man. Because when you look into the natural world, you don't see divinity. You see the opposite. You see predator-prey relations, murder, death, suffering. And then if you're trying to reason from all this and you're looking, well, the world's a lot of bad, but it's also got some good. And how do we assimilate all of this into divinity? That's the problem. 
St. John Damascus is going to shut that down right off the bat. He says, we, we don't know like exactly how God is, but we do have what he's revealed to us. So let's start there. Let's start our theology, our philosophy there, not with our own rationality, not with our own assumptions and presuppositions and biases that will lead us right back into the flux of time and space that we've lived through since the dawn of history. Okay. <clears throat> so after he lays this out, he says that we can't know the true nature of God as it exists in relation between the three persons of the Trinity. We won't know that. Okay. But what we can know is the personal representations of the Trinity, such as the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That we can know. So that's where we really need to start. We need to start with acknowledging we'll never find a first principle to God because God paradoxically exists between the one and the many. He is neither one, or he is both one and many. He is both one and three. He is not just one, and he is not just three. He is one and three. Because the, the divine nature is shared between the three persons. One nature, three persons. Okay? So that's where we're going to start there. Okay? <clears throat> now, he'll go on to kind of address some of these problems. Um that we see in the Greek tradition and what has kind of been coming up in, uh, in, in the tradition and coming up in society and culture at that time. And granted, he's also living in uh, an area ruled by the Islamic tradition. So he's seeing heresy, he's seeing false teachings, uh, he's seeing all this kind of stuff, uh, but he's trying to really uh, summarize the, the Orthodox tradition so that we kind of already know. And he starts by, again, saying we can't know the first principle of God. <clears throat> now, what he says right here is he starts to refute this dialectical tension. As we read on, he starts to refute that things need to be in opposition to each other, such as good and evil. Now, when you first say that, you're going to think, well aren't good and evil in opposition to each other. No, they're not, because evil doesn't have its own existence. It borrows existence from the good. Okay, now that sounds like kind of out there. If that doesn't make sense, let me explain it a different way. Um, okay, when you lie, if you tell just a flat-out lie, like the sky is red or purple or rainbow, Okay, and you go out and you look up and it's blue and you're like, it's clearly blue, dude. Okay, that's a flat out lie. That didn't really get you anywhere, right? Because that wasn't real. Okay, that wasn't real enough to situate itself and to portray itself like an actual reality. So how do we tell good lies? Well, you're going to use as much truth as possible and negate some very small details that uh, will mislead just enough for your purpose. Yeah. Okay. So does that falsity that you're injecting into what would be truth, does that have existence? No, that's a lie. It's a falsehood. It's a false reality. A lie is a false reality, a false story, a false narrative, false meaning not real. And what did St. John Damascus just say about knowledge? That it is what is real. So the church fathers are going to believe that evil doesn't have its own existence unless it borrows it from God. So Satan doesn't have his own existence unless he borrows from God's already created reality. He doesn't have the power to create and assimilate his own reality. Evil doesn't have that kind of power. What it can do, though, is negate and twist and, and confuse and mingle and mesh and pull into chaos and what is chaos but disintegrated order you know so 
Uh, now here's, here's he's going to reiterate again. He says, thus it is clear that God exists. But what he is in essence and nature, or what he what he knows himself as. Okay, you know how you know yourself? Okay, you know your essence. What your essence, your soul, your feelings, your thoughts, you know you in yourself. Okay, how God knows himself, we can never know. And he says, he in his essence and nature is unknown and beyond all understanding. That he is without a body is obvious. For how could a body contain that which is limitless, boundless, formless, impalpable, invisible, simple, and uncom uncompounded? How could it be immutable if it were circumscribed and subject to change? And how could that which is composed of elements and reducible to them be not subject to change? Composition is the cause of conflict. Conflict, the cause of separation, and separation, the cause of dissolution. But do, dissolution altogether is foreign to God. <clears throat> okay, so he goes on to say, All this, however, is by no means indicative of his essence, no more than is the fact of his being unbegotten, without beginning, immutable, and incorruptible or any of those other things which are affirmed of God or about him. These do not show what he is, but rather what he is not. Right? So this is, this is going to be a, a common idea between both the Greeks and the Christians is that, um, and I'll, I'll show you where this differs, is they both believe that you can make um, analogous or uh, uh, apathetic uh Posits about God or negative posits about God as referring to what he is not. Okay, that would be apathetic or apathetic, yeah. Apathetic, yeah. That would be an apathetic and a cataphatic would be a positive. Now, the Orthodox Christians believe that we can make positive affirmations and negative affirmations about God to help us figure out who he is. The Greeks believe that no positive affirmations can be made about God, only negative ones. Because any positive affirmation wouldn't do justice to the superiority or divinity of what would be their God. And that's the difference between the Orthodox. Because the Orthodox believes like, yes, you can say God is love. But God isn't just love. Okay? So you could say God is, God is good. But he's not the good. He's not just the good. Shout out to Plotinus. Um, the Greeks, on the other hand, they're going to make the opposite thing. And they're going to say, no, we can only just say what God is not. We will never know what God is in his or what, what he is. He's so beyond all language and all distinction and all categorization that we'll never know. OK, well, so then you just created an unknowable God. OK, so the Orthodox use both positive cataphatic and apophatic um, uh, predications of God. Okay. So that's important. Um, now, here's, here's really interesting, too. He goes on to say the divinity, then, is limitless and incomprehensible. And this is... This, his limitless and incomprehensibility, is all that can be understood about him. All that we state affirmatively about God does not show his nature, but only what relates to his nature. And if he should ever speak of good or justice or wisdom or something else of the sort, you will not be describing the nature of God, but only things related to his nature. That's what we just said. He's refuting absolute divine simplicity. An absolute divine simplicity is basically making predicates about God based on his actions or his characteristics and attributing that to his totality in his being, right? Like saying the difference between God is the source of love and God is love, okay? Well, if you say God is just love, God is love, 
well, then you're going to have to distinguish in his essence between what really love is and how do you come to know that. If you predicate just the actions of God to God to his essence, how do you ever distinguish between when he's judging you or when he's not or when he's being nice? And or how do you know? Right. How do you know what's going on there? It just really pulls you into the unknowability of God, which is something uh, Palamas will come to say in the 13th century when he's arguing. Uh, what's his name? Barlam? Bar Barlamite? Barlamite? <clears throat> Sides the point. Um, but yeah, so here he's just saying that, look, you can say these things about God. Just know that that's not all God is. He's not all just what you can say about it. He exists far beyond all this in a mystery that we will be forever exploring uh, into eternity. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so... So then he goes on to talk about kind of the spirit in the Trinity. Um, and then he starts to lay out kind of what the Orthodox general position is. And I think we'll end it here. Um, obviously, there is much more to this book. Okay. He gets very deep in the later chapters into Christ for like two, I think almost two full chapters. He's getting into, um, or two full books. He's getting into uh the deity and humanity of Christ and making sure that's clear. Um, and then later kind of wrapping it up at the end uh, with some general, like the saints, um, faith, uh, more on Christ, um, the Trinity, kind of just summarizing evil, the Sabbath, kind of getting into more some more nuanced stuff uh, towards the end. But right off the bat, the first three books in the Fountain of Knowledge uh, are the general orthodox position, Christ's distinctions and his identity, and then general uh, inquiries towards the end, such as such as faith and the saints and uh, grace and and stuff like that. So this is the general summary of the orthodox faith, and I will read I will read some of this, and you will be welcome to go read the rest. Uh, so he goes. Therefore, we believe in one God one principle without beginning uncreated unbegotten indestructible and immortal eternal unlimited unsubscribed unbound infinite in power simple uncompounded incorporeal unchanging unaffected unchangeable in alternate invisible source of goodness and justice light intellectual and inaccessible power which no measure can give any idea of but which is measured only by his own will for he can do all things whatsoever he pleases maker of all things both visible and invisible holding together all things and conserving them provider for all governing and dominating and ruling over all in unending and immortal reign without contradiction filling all things contained by nothing but himself containing all things being their conserver and first possessor pervading all substances without being defiled, removed far beyond all things and every substance as being super substantial and surpassing all, super eminently divine and good and replete, appointing all the principalities and orders set above every principality and order, above essence and life and speech and concept, light itself and goodness and being in so far as having neither being nor anything else that is from any other, the very source of being from all things that are of life to the living, of speech to the articulate, and the cause of all good things for all, knowing all things before they begin to be one substance, one Godhead or Trinity, one virtue, one will, one operation, one principality, one power, one dominion, one kingdom, known in three perfect persons and adored with one adoration, believed in the worship, believe and worshiped by every rational creature, united without confusion and distinct without separation. Right there, that is massive, united without confusion. 
want to highlight that actually. That's just that's just too good. United without confusion, distinct without separation, which is beyond understanding. What's he saying right there? He just solved the problem of the one of the many. He said united without confusion. Meaning when the three are you the three persons of the Trinity are united, they don't fall into one undefined blob God. They're distinct people. They're distinct personal beings that operate in one will, one virtue, one Godhead, one substance, one operation, one principality, one power, one dominion, one kingdom. Three in one, the problem of the one and the many. He solves it. He says, united without confusion and distinction without separation, which is beyond all understanding. We believe in the Father and Son and Holy Spirit in whom we have been baptized. For it is thus that the Lord enjoined the, the apostles, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And now I'm going to read the last par one last paragraph here. This goes on. This goes on for multiple pages. He, he's laying this out. He's making sure there's no questions here because they've been answering questions on this for eight centuries. They're tired of answering questions. They need it all laid out. He says, we believe in one father, the principle and cause of all things. This is what distinguishes the father from the son. The father's the first principle. The principle and cause of all things. That's the father. Begotten of no one, who alone is uncaused and unbegotten, the maker of all things, and by nature, father of his one and only begotten son. So part of the personal identity of the father is the begotting of the son, making him a father, and also being the first principle to all things, the source of all things. Okay? It says, our Lord and God and Savior, Jesus Christ the emitter of the all Holy Spirit. We also believe in one Son of God, the only begotten, our Lord Jesus Christ, who was begotten of the Father before all ages. So Christ exists as the Logos, as the Word of God, before all, all ages. <clears throat> light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, Consubstantial with the Father, by whom all things were made. So who made all things? Christ. In regard to whom, when we say that he is before all ages, we mean that he is beginning. His beginning is outside of time and without beginning. For the Son of God was not brought from nothing into being, who is the brightness of the glory and the figure of the substance of the Father. So what is Christ? He is who is the brightness of the glory and the figure of the substance of the Father, his living power and wisdom, the substant word, the substantial and perfect and living image of the invisible God. Actually, he was always with the Father, being begotten of him eternally and without beginning. For the Father never was when the Son was not. But the Father and the Son begotten of him exist together simultaneously. Because the Father could not be so called without a son. Now, if he was not father when he did not have the son and then later became father without having been father before. Then he was changed from not being father to being father, which is the worst of all blasphemies. St. John says to admit that Christ wasn't with the Father from all time is the worst of all blasphemies because it implies a change in the Godhead. And the Godhead is unchangeable, unchangeable, ever existent, eternal, and perfect. Well, to be perfect, you can't have change because perfect implies uh, actualization, a perfect actualization, uh, uh, a standard, a principle that does not change. Uh, for it is impossible to speak of God as naturally lacking the power of begetting. And the power of begetting is the power to beget of oneself, that is, of one's own substance, offspring similar to oneself in nature. So I think that's pretty good for today. 
is a nice little refresher for me on St. John. I got to read it again. Um, but we can see here that, look, the Orthodox are very particular to make note of where their distinctions lay in their theology. Why? Because it avoids heresies. It avoids heresies. It avoids issues in the church. Look at Protestantism today. You can go to one church that says it's Christian and drive five miles down the road, and there's another one, and they're teaching two completely different things. Is that Christianity? Is Christianity supposed to be something that uh, can change and flux and adapt to culture, or is it supposed to have some values and some things that it does not change its mind on? I would say the latter. And so would the church fathers. And not only that, did the church fathers risk not only their lives and, and many martyrdoms, but put time into writing such a long expedition in the face of the Islamic tradition and in the face of pagan, Gnostic, Greek, philosophical, theological jargons and heresies. That's important. And it's important to ask yourself, what did the first Christians believe? Is that not important? And if you take that seriously, you're going to wind up at this guy's doorstep. Anyway, thank you so much, guys. Uh, I highly recommend that you get that book for yourself. Uh, remember, I will be posting probably Sunday, maybe Monday, the day before, um, for our new guest. That will be coming on Tuesday, so look out for that. We're going to be going deeper into, you know, uh, inverted logic, you know, satanic thought, um, some more in the dialectics, philosophy, um, some theology as well. You know, the use, the good stuff. So anyway, guys, thank you so much, man. I hope that you all enjoyed this. Please like, share, comment, all that great fun stuff if you would, please. And uh, thank you to all the new subscribers, guys. Um, we're not huge, but hey, dude, I didn't expect it to get this big this fast, so I'll take it.